This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. News of the Beanfield episode convinced Washington officials to take direct action of the sort Stimson and McCloy had originally urged. With the explicit approval of Sidney Hillman and the certain knowledge of Murray and Thomas, Roosevelt signed an executive order that authorized the Army to seize the plant and break the strike. On the morning of June 9th, 2,500 troops with fixed bayonets moved in, broke up the existing picket lines, and prohibited public assembly within a mile of the plant. Stimson ordered California draft boards to cancel the deferments of those who refused to return to work. When leaders of the strike attempted to organize a march back into the plant, military forces on the scene disrupted this show of solidarity. Why did the California communists call the disastrous North American aviation strike? Even more importantly, why did they think it had a chance of success? The answers lie not only in the politics of those who led the strike, but in their mistaken perception of labor politics in the spring of 1941. Although only a few unionists were influenced by the Communist Party analysis of the international situation, this stratum struck a responsive chord when they appealed to rank-and-file workers on a program of aggressive trade unionism. Communists in the unions were far less interested in sabotaging the defense program, as charged by their pro-Roosevelt opponents, than in taking advantage of the favorable economic circumstances of the defense boom to secure organizational gains against a particularly intransigent set of employers. This strategy was not too different from that pursued by John L. Lewis during the next few years, or the one that Philip Murray had outlined in the fall of 1940. Of course, by demonstrating the superiority of a militant strategy in the CIO, the communists hoped to advance their politics within the union movement. In this sense, their strikes were political. Throughout most of early 1941, these tactics paid off. The key to their success lay in the fact that aggressive unionists were able to maintain the public support of top CIO officials, who provided a buffer between the increasingly conservative pressures emanating from Washington and the disruptive organizing activities conducted in the field. Murray and Thomas backed the Volte and Alice Chalmers strikes, authorized the Ford walkout, defended free collective bargaining, and the right to strike. The NDMB no-strike policy had not yet been solidly cast, nor had important elements in the UAW or the CIO accepted its authority on those terms. John L. Lewis, for example, kept the UMW on strike in April while board hearings on the new coal contract remained in progress. The faction of the UAW led by George Addis had strong misgivings about cooperation with an NDMB no-strike policy. Throughout the spring, several small strikes, some communist-led, continued despite NDMB calls to return to work. From the point of view of internal trade union practice and tradition, the organizers of the North American aviation strike were playing by the rules as they had previously existed. Major strikes, especially organizational ones, were often called by union activists on the scene, then authorized by higher officials once they appeared successful. Such was the case in the Great Ford Strike two months earlier, and local 683 leaders expected, or at least hoped, that the same pattern would be followed at Inglewood. A successful strike was always its own best recommendation, as even Frankenstein freely recognized. When the local first set a strike deadline in late May, he told its officers, Don't worry about strike sanction. It's only a scrap of paper. Anyway, I can fix that. <laughs>